Well, I shot a response, didn't actually get around to editing it, and uh, after uh, some deliberation, um, decided at the time to pass on posting it regarding the entire proposition of theism as a mental disorder that will eventually appear in the DSM. Um, but uh, on further consideration, I'm going to uh, chop that down to a manageable length and um, parse that in a little bit here. A couple of, uh, well, the fundamental problem with this approach that you're taking um, is based on a misunderstanding of how the diagnostic process works. Now, I get into this in some detail and some of the bits and pieces that are going to follow. But there was one particular um, question that was asked in the superimposed text in this video. Um, why would we not consider uh, people who believe in God mentally disordered when we um, institutionalize people for belief in fairies or UFOs? Um, that's a fiction. <laughs> That is fiction. <laughs> the proposition that we institutionalize people for those reasons is, um, it's a fantasy. People are not institutionalized for belief in fairies or for believing that, um, that they were abducted by UFOs. I mean, in point of fact, uh, in point of fact, at least in the United States, we're in, um, both a cultural, economic, um, and scientific context where it's pretty damn difficult to involuntarily institutionalize anyone prior to their commission of a crime. And, uh, and a crime uh, wherein we can determine that uh, their mental illness was the primary causal factor, which almost never happens. These beliefs, even in, uh, even in the case of a clearly disordered mind, um, wherein uh, treatment is legally mandated, um, a decision is handed down from the court that this person must be treated. Um, even in these cases, these delusional ideas are but one aspect of the operation of this disordered mind or the disordered operation of the mind. They are but one aspect. Now, throughout this entire series of responses, um, you've been operating from, and well, not just this dialogue, but in general, your uh, um, the entirety of your videos, your um, your online debates, so on and so forth. Um, you appear to be operating from a very specific, rigid position, um, wherein you have epistemic criteria and predicates that you do not declare that you do not describe in full. Um, this is something that uh, the Joneses um, decided to address with a couple of clips of mine, with my permission, and seems interested in following that particular line of reasoning. Um, so I'm going to leave that to him. He's got it well covered. But that being said, there is significant overlap between the axiomatic approach that you're using regarding words like proof and the host of undeclared epistemological predicates and undescribed epistemological predicates upon which your use of that word relies. There is overlap between this and between your general approach to what, uh, how, how you view psychotherapy should operate within society and what psychology can and cannot determine about the operation of human mind and the formation of human thought. Psychology is not concerned with truth value and it's only secondarily concerned with transparency of cognitive processes, which incidentally is a question that you have never asked. Certainly not in this line uh, certainly not in this line of videos. You're not even you're not even addressing uh, secondary psychological concerns. You're dealing entirely with propositions, as if propositions were some sort of diagnostic criteria. Well, again, um, I get into some of this in some of the odds and ends that I'm going to be splicing in here. So um, I'll just let the old footage uh, do some gabbing. I am a layman in this field. 
uh, I am a layman. I would point to my copy of the DSM, but uh, I'd be pointing at my screen um, because I access the DSM for TR through um, Psychology Online and my subscription there. First and foremost, we must recognize that the DSM is a tool in the diagnostic process. It is not a substitute for the diagnostic process. A uh, point of concern that I have with the way that the argument is generally going is the way that the DSM is being used. Citation of authority is all well and good as a method of corroboration. Um, it's a way of supporting a conclusion that has already been independently developed, and this is critical. Um, independently developed with a demonstrable degree of diligence similar to the citation source. Citation is not intended to be used as a substitute for diligence. Quite the contrary. It's largely a, a cultural ideal, but generally speaking, uh, citation, when you're talking about um, when you're talking about prose text, you're talking about stated conclusion rather than uh, diagnostic methodologies, uh, studied statistics, so on and so forth. When you're citing conclusions, one is, uh, if anything, expected to be more diligent, to be carrying these conclusions further, and with a greater degree of diligence than that which is being referenced. Um, otherwise, it's uh, regurgitation. And the metaphor of regurgitation is particularly apt here because when we regurgitate in the context of a work with less diligence, with less intellectual or academic exhaustiveness than the source that we're citing, um, we, are, uh, <laughs> we are expelling something in a form that is less useful than it was when we ate it. Um, I, I don't think many people would argue that vomit is less useful than food. When we uh, cite a source, um, and uh, do so in a way where we are presenting um, less thoroughly developed conclusions than those in the source, that's exactly what we're doing. We're turning food into vomit. Normality or conventionality certainly does have a powerful influence on the field of psychology, but psychology is not exclusively concerned with normality. What we're talking about is to some degree the tension in psychology, both in theory and practice, between conventionality and mechanism. Um, whether we are assessing the conventionality of propositions presented uh, by a patient or whether we are assessing the methods, uh, the conventionality of the methods wherein they come to these conclusions. Now, conventionality of proposition, um, again, is very problematic uh, for some of the reasons that Supex mentioned, um, but uh, also uh, because conventionality of proposition is highly contingent on cultural context, on education level, so on and so forth. But conventionality of methodology is perhaps even more of a problem. Establishing whether one's thought processes themselves, whether they're uh, synthetic, analytic, or dialectic um, thought construction um, operates on conventional lines is highly problematic. Um, first, it would require an astonishing degree of introspection and self-awareness on the part of the patient and generally speaking um, introspection and self-awareness is part of what the therapeutic process is about so it wouldn't be very useful as a diagnostic method but also when you're dealing with conventionality of method you're dealing with ideas like uh, sequence um, method of construction um, and then we've got all sorts of problems like inductive reasoning uh, again, conventionality of method just breaks down very rapidly. And even that, assuming that we were dealing with something in the first place that can be defined in terms of convention, which uh, I would say, and this is just me here, um, I would say that the general sequence and structure of human thought is too complex and too contextually derived for us to define any sort of conventional norms for how people construct ideas. However, we can identify specific capacities which are relatively universal or at least universally desirable. Certain ways of forming thought, regardless of where they would fit into a sequence or the application of this specific method, just simply the capacity of this method. 
um, we can say is universally desirable or um, is generally present. And that's where we get into questions of is this person integrating? Are they capable of synthesizing thought, assessment, so on and so forth? 